Ricky Ticky Tabby by Rudyard Kipling is a longer story that you'll want to be in a comfortable spot as you listen and follow along. An older story I've heard since I was your age. The author dedicates this to Ellen and Alan Cover. Now this is the story of the great war that Ricky Ticky Tabby fought all by himself through the English family's house in India. Ricky Ticky Tabby was a mongoose with fur and a tail like a cat's and a head like a weasel's. One day a summer flood washed him out of the burrow where he lived with his father and mother and they floated with him kicking and clucking down a roadside ditch. He found a stick floating near him and he held on to it until he fainted. When he was revived, he was lying in the middle of a garden path, very wet indeed, and a little boy was saying, here's a dead mongoose, let's have a funeral. No, said his mother, let's take him and dry him, perhaps he isn't really dead. So they took him into the house, where a big man picked him up and said he wasn't dead, just tired. So they wrapped him in cotton and warmed him over a little fire, and he opened his eyes and sneezed. Now, says the big man, who was the boy's father, don't frighten him, and we'll see what he'll do. It was the hardest thing in the world to frighten a mongoose, because he was full of curiosity from nose to tail. The motto of the mongoose family is go and find out, and Ricky Ticky Tabby was a true mongoose. He looked at the cotton, decided it wasn't good to eat. He ran around the table, sat up, scratched himself, and jumped on the boy's shoulder. Don't be frightened, Teddy, said his father. That's his way of making friends. <laughs> he tickles, said Teddy. Ricky Ticky snuffled at the boy's ear and climbed down to the floor where he sat rubbing his nose. Is he so tame because we helped him, asked Teddy's mother. All mongooses are like that, said the husband. If Teddy doesn't pick him up by the tail, he'll run in and out of the house all day long. Let's give him something to eat. So they gave him a little piece of raw meat, which Ricky Ticky liked immensely. There are more things to find out about this house, he said to himself, than all my family could find out in all their lives. I shall certainly stay and find out. He spent the day roaming around the house. He nearly drowned in the bathtub, put his nose in ink on the desk, and he burned it on the end of the big man's cigar. When Teddy went to bed, Ricky Ticky climbed up too. Teddy's mother and father came in before he went to bed, and Ricky Ticky was awake on the pillow. I don't like this, said Teddy's mother. He might bite. He won't, said the father. Teddy's safer with that little animal than a watchdog if a snake came into his room. But Teddy's mother wouldn't think of anything so awful. Early in the morning, Ricky Ticky came to breakfast on the porch, riding on Teddy's shoulder, and they gave him a banana and some boiled egg, and he sat on all their laps one after the other. Then Ricky Ticky was out into the backyard to see what it was like to be seen. It was a large yard with rose bushes as big as houses, lime and orange trees and clumps of bamboos. Ricky Ticky scuttled up and down the garden, snuffling here and there until he heard very sad voices and a thorn brush. It was Darzee, the tailor bird, and his wife. They had made a beautiful nest by pulling two leaves together and stitching up the edges, and they had filed the inside with they had filled the inside with fluff. What's the matter? asked Ricky Ticky. <laughs> We're miserable, said Darcy. One of our babies fell out of the nest yesterday, and Nag ate him. Hmm, said Ricky Ticky. That is very sad, but I'm a stranger here. Who is Nag? Darcy and his wife cowered down in the nest without answering. For from the thick grass at the foot of the bush there came a low hiss, a horrid cold sound. And then inch by inch out of the grass rose up the head of Nag, the big cobra, and he was five foot long from tongue to tail. When he had lifted one third of himself clear of the ground, he swayed like a dandelion tucked in the wind, and he looked at Ricky Ticky with the wicked snake's eyes that never changed their expression, whatever the snake may be thinking. Who is Nag? said he. I am Nag. Look and be afraid. Ricky Ticky was afraid for a minute, but it is impossible for a mongoose to stay frightened for very long. Ricky Ticky had never met a live cobra before, but his mother had fed him on the dead ones, and he knew that a mongoose's job is to fight and eat snakes. Nag knew that too, and at the bottom of his cold heart, he was afraid. Oh well, said Ricky Ticky, I am looking, but do you think it is right for you to eat baby birds? 
Nag was watching for movement in the grass behind Rikki Tikki, and he knew that mongooses in the garden meant death sooner or later for him and his family. So he dropped his head a little and said, Let's talk. You eat eggs, why shouldn't I eat birds? Behind you. Look behind you, said Darzee. So Rikki Tikki jumped up in the air as high as he could go, and just under him whizzed the head of Nagania. Nag's wicked wife. She had crept up behind him as he was talking to kill him, and he heard her hiss as the stroke missed. He came down almost across her back and bit, but he did not bite long enough, and he jumped away from the whisking tail, leaving Nagania torn and angry. Wicked, wicked Darzee, said Nag, lashing up as high as he could to reach toward the nest, but Darzee had built it out of the reach of the snakes, and Rikki Tikki felt his eyes getting hot and angry, and he sat back on his tail and his hind legs like a little kangaroo, and he chattered with rage. But Nag and Nagania had disappeared into the grass, and Rikki Tikki did not follow them, for he did not feel so sure he could manage two snakes at once. So he trotted off to the garden path near the house, and he sat down. Ricky Tikki was just a young mongoose, and he was very pleased that he had managed to escape an attack from behind. When Teddy came running down the path, Ricky Tikki was ready to be petted. But just as Teddy was leaning down, something squirmed in the dust, and a tiny voice said, Be careful, I am death. It was Carrot, the little brown snakeling that lies on the dusty ground in India and whose bite is as dangerous as the cobra's. Ricky Tikki's eyes grew angry again and he danced up to Carrot with a strange rocking swaying motion that he had inherited from his family. Now it looks very funny but it also is perfectly balanced so that he could fly off in any direction if he wanted and in dealing with snakes this was an advantage. He rocked back and forth looking for a good place to hold. Carrot struck. Ricky jumped sideways and the wicked little dusty head lashed right near his shoulder. Teddy shouted to the house, Come look, our mongoose is killing a snake. And Ricky Ticky heard a scream from Teddy's mother. His father ran out with a stick. But by the time he came up, Ricky Ticky had sprung, jumped on the snake's back, bitten as high as he could and rolled away. That bite paralyzed Carrot, and Ricky Ticky was just going to eat him from the tail to the head after a custom of his family when he remembered that a big meal makes a slow mongoose. So he went away for a dust bath under the bushes while Teddy's father beat the dead snake. What's the use of that, thought Ricky Ticky. I've already settled it all. And then Ricky's mother pulled him up and hugged him, saying that he had saved R Teddy's life. Ricky Ticky did not understand the fuss. Teddy's mother might just as well have hugged Teddy for playing in the mud. Ricky was thoroughly enjoying himself, and that night at dinner, walking among the glasses on the table, he could have stuffed himself with good things, but did not. Though it was very pleasant to be petted, he remembered that Nag and Nagania from time to time would give his war cry of Ricky. Teddy carried him to bed and insisted that Ricky Ticky sleep under his chin. But as soon as Teddy was asleep, he went for his nightly walk around the house, and in the dark he ran up against Chakura, the muskrat, creeping up near the wall. Chakura is a scared little beast. He whimpers and he cheeps, cheeps all night, trying to make up his mind to run in the middle of the room, but never gets there. Don't kill me, he said. Ricky Ticky, don't kill me. Do you think a snake killer kills muskrats? asked Ricky Ticky scornfully. Well, those who kill snakes get killed by snakes, they said. And how am I to be sure that Nag won't mistake me for you some dark night? There's no danger, said Ricky Ticky. Nag is in the garden and you don't go there. My cousin the rat told me, said Chakunda, and then he stopped. Told you what? Hush! Nag is everywhere, Ricky Ticky. Can't you hear? Catch a soft scratch, scratch sound. He did a noise as quiet as the footsteps of a fly in a window pane. The dry scratch of a snake's scale on brick. That's Nag or Nagania, he said, and whoever it is, it's crawling into the bathroom drain. Thank you, Chikunda. So he crept into Teddy's bed bathroom, but there was nothing there. And then he crept into Teddy's parents' bathroom, and at the bottom of the plaster wall there was a brick pulled out to make a drain for the bathwater. As Ricky Ticky listened, he heard Nag and Nagania whisper together in the moonlight. 
When the house is emptied of people, said Naganiya, he will go away, and the garden will be ours again, so go in quietly, and remember that the big man who killed Carrot is the first one to bite, and then come out, and we will hunt for Ricky Ticky. But are you sure we must kill those people? asked Nag. Yes. When there are no people in the house, did we have a mongoose in the garden? As long as there is a house... As long as the house is empty, we are king and queen of the garden. Remember, as soon as our eggs hatch, our children will need room and quiet. I had not thought of that, said Nag. I will go, but there is no need to hunt for Ricky Ticky. I will kill the man and the woman and the child if I can. Then the house will be empty, and Ricky Ticky will leave. Ricky Ticky tingled all over with rage at this, and then Nag's head came through the drain, and his five foot of cold body followed. Angry as he was, Ricky Ticky was very frightened when he saw the size of the cobra. Nag raised his head and looked into the bathroom, and Ricky could see his eyes glitter in the dark. When Carrot was killed, the man had a stick, said the snake, but when he comes to bathe in the morning, he won't have it. I'll wait here till he comes. Nagania, do you hear me? I'll wait here till daytime. There was no answer, so Ricky Ticky knew Nagania had gone away. Nag coiled himself down, coil by coil, around the bathroom of the water jar that was used to fill the bath. Ricky Ticky stayed as still as death. After an hour, he began to move muscle by muscle toward the jar. Nag was asleep, and Ricky Ticky looked at him, wondering how, wondering how to attack. If I don't break his back at the first jump, thought Ricky, he can still fight. And if he fights, oh, Ricky, it must be the head, he decided finally, and I must not let go. And then he jumped, and as he bit, Ricky braced his back against the water jar to hold down the snake's head. And then he was battered back and forth as a toy shaken by a dog, back and forth and up and down and around in circles. But he held on to the snake's body, and he whipped across the floor, and he banged across the side of the bathtub, and he closed his jaw tighter and tighter, for he was sure he wanted to be banged to death. And for the honor of his family, he wanted to be found with his teeth locked. He was dizzy, aching, and felt shaken to pieces when something went off like a thunderclap just behind him. A red fire stinged his fur. Teddy's father had been awakened by the noise and had fired a shotgun into Nag. Ricky Ticky held on with his eyes shut, for now he was sure to be dead, but the man picked him up and he said, It's the mongoose again. This little guy has saved our lives now. And when morning came, Ricky Ticky was very stiff but well pleased with himself. Now I have Nagania to deal with, and she will be worse than five nags, and there's no knowing when the eggs will hatch, so I must go see Darcy, he said. Without waiting for breakfast, Ricky Ticky ran to the thorn brush where Darcy was singing a song of triumph and the voice of the, at the top of his voice. Now the news of Nag's death was all over the garden, because his body had been put into the garbage heap. Oh, you stupid topped off feathers, said Ricky Ticky. Is this time to sing? Nag is dead, 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 sang Darcy. The valiant Ricky Ticky caught him by the head and held tight, and the big man brought the bang stick, and Nag broke in two pieces. He will never eat my babies again. You're safe enough in your nest there, said Ricky Ticky, but it's war for me down here. Stop singing a minute, Darcy. For the great Ricky Ticky's sake, I will stop, said Darcy. What is it, O oh killer of terrible Nag? Where is Nagania? On the garbage heap at the staples, mourning for Nag, great Ricky Ticky of the white teeth. Never mind my right my white teeth. Do you know where she keeps her eggs? Oh, in the melon bed at the end of the nearest at the end nearest the wall, where the sun strikes nearly all day. Ricky Ticky, you're not going to eat her eggs. Um, not Eat, exactly, no. Darcy, can you fly off to the stables and pretend your wing is broken and let Nagania chase you back to this bush? I must get to the melon bed, and if I were there now, she would see me. So Darcy knew that Nagania's children were born in eggs like his own, so he didn't think it far off to kill them. But his wife was a sensible bird, and she knew that a cobra's eggs meant young cobras later on, so she flew from the nest and left Darzi to keep the babies warm. She flew in front of Nagania, and she called out, My wing is broken. The boy in the house threw a stone at me and broke it. Nagania lifted her head up and hissed, You've picked a bad place to be lame in. And she moved toward the bird, slipping over the dust. The boy broke it with a stone, cried Darzi's wife. Well, 
It may please you to know that when you are dead, I will deal with him. Before night, the boy in the house will lie very still. Now what's the use of running away? I'm sure to catch you. But Darcy's wife fluttered on, never leaving the ground, and Nagania slithered faster. Ricky Ticky heard them going up the path, and he raced for the end of the melon patch near the wall. They're very cleverly hidden. He found a twenty-five small eggs. I was just in time, he thought, for he could see the baby cobras curled up inside the skin, and he knew that the minute they were hatched, they could each kill a man or a mongoose, so he bit the tops off the eggs as fast as he could, crushing the deadly young snakes, and at last there were only three, le three eggs left. Then he heard Darcy's wife screaming, Ricky Ticky, I led Nagania toward the house, and she's gone onto the porch, and oh, come quickly, she means killing. Ricky Ticky smashed two eggs, and with a third egg in his mouth, he scuttled to the porch as fast as he could. Teddy and his mother and his father were there at breakfast, but they were not eating anything. They were stone still, and their faces pale. Nagania was coiled up within easy striking distance of Teddy's bare leg, and she was swaying back and forth, singing a song of triumph. Son of the man who killed Nag, she hissed, stay still. Keep very still, all three of you. If you move, I strike. And if you do not move, I strike. Oh, foolish people who killed my Nag. Teddy's eyes were fixed on his father, but all his father could do was whisper, sit still, Teddy. Don't move. Keep still. And then Ricky Ticky came up and he cried, turn around, Nagania, turn and bite. All in good time, she said without moving her eyes. I'll deal with you later. Look at your friends, Ricky Ticky. They dare not move. And if you come a step closer, I strike. <laughs> look at your eggs in the melon patch, said Ricky Ticky. Go and look, Nagania. The snake turned half around and saw the egg. Give it to me, she said. Ricky Ticky held the egg. What price for a snake's egg? For a young cobra, for the last, the very last of the brood. The ants are eating all the others down by the melon patch. Nagania spun around, forgetting everything for the sake of one egg, and Ricky Ticky saw Teddy's father grab Teddy off by the shoulder, drag him across the table with the teacups out of reach of Nagania. Tripped, 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 Ricky Ticky. Oh, cried Ricky Ticky. The boy is safe. And it was I, 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 that caught Nag last night in the bathroom. He threw me back and forth, but he could not shake me off. He was dead before the man killed him. I did it. Ricky, Ticky, Ticker. Come, Nagania, come and fight to me. Nagania saw that she had lost her chance of killing Teddy, and the egg lay between Ricky Ticky's paws. Give me the egg, Ricky Ticky, and I will go away and never come back, she said. Yes, you'll go away. You'll never come back because you'll be dead. Fight, snake. The man has gone for his gun. Fight. So Ricky Ticky was bounding all around Nagania, keeping just out of her reach. Nagania gathered herself and struck out at him. Ricky Ticky jumped up and back. Again and again and again she struck, and each time her head hit with a whack on the matting of the porch. And then Ricky Ticky danced on the ground to get behind her, and Nagania spun around to face him. Ricky Ticky had forgotten the egg. It laid on the porch, and Nagania had come nearer and nearer to it. Until at last, when Ricky Ticky was taking a breath, she caught in her mouth, turned to the steps, and flew down the path where Ricky Ticky was behind her. Ricky Ticky knew he must catch her, or all the trouble would begin again. She headed straight for the long grass by the thorn brush, and she was running. Ricky Ticky heard Darzee still singing his song of triumph, but Darzee's wife was smarter. She flew off her nest as Nagania came along and flapped her wings at Nagania's head. Nagania only lowered her head and went on. But the instant's delay let Ricky Ticky catch up with her, and as she plunged into the hole where she and Nag used to live, his little white teeth clenched on her tail. Ricky Ticky went down with her, and very few mongooses, however wise and old they may be, care to follow a cobra into its hole. It was dark in the hole, and Ricky Ticky never knew what might widen and give to give Nagania room to turn and to strike at him. When the grass by the mouth of the hole stopped waving, Darzi said, It's all over with Ricky Ticky. We must sing his death song, for Nagania will surely kill him underground. So he sang a very mournful song that he had just made up. And right at the saddest part, the grass quivered again. And Ricky Ticky dragged himself out of the hole, leg by leg, licking his whiskers. Ricky Ticky shook some of the dust off of his fur, and he sneezed it all over, he said. The snake will never come out again. And the red ants that live between the grass 
Soon stems had heard him. They began to troop down the hole to see if he had spoken the truth. And when Ricky got into the house, Teddy and Teddy's mother and father came out and almost cried over him. And that night he ate everything that was given to him until he could eat no more. He went to bed on Teddy's shoulder where Teddy's mother saw him. And she looked over and she looked late into the night. He saved our lives, she said to her husband. Just think, he saved all our lives. Ricky Ticky woke with a jump for all moose. Mongooses are light sleepers. Oh, it's you, said he. What are you awake for? All the cobras are dead, and if they weren't, I'm here. Ricky Ticky had a right to be proud of himself, and he kept the garden as a mongoose should keep it, with tooth and jump and spring and bite, till never a cobra dared show its head inside the walls. And that is the end of the story of Ricky Ticky Tech.